Chapter Seven of A Soldier of the Legion by George Mannington. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven, Part One: The Last Struggles of a Rebellion, Departure of Captain Plessier, Our New Commander, Man Hunting, A Friend in Need, A False Alarm, An Unexpected Rise in Life, On the Brigade Staff the remnants of the rebel forces which had been smashed and dispersed by colonel giles column in the lower yen Te, fled north and rallied round their chief de tam who was hiding together with a small number of his most trusted retainers in one of the wildest spots in the dense forest region of the northwest of nha nam and about ten miles from that fort this district is known to the natives by the name of quin lo at this time owing to the large number of rebels we had slain or captured or who had surrendered during the past two months the total number of insurgents with de tam did not exceed two hundred efforts had been made by the provincial mandarins to secure the chieftain's submission the french government preferring if possible to adopt a policy of conciliation rather than run the risks and be burdened with the heavy expense resulting from a protracted struggle with such a brave resourceful and mobile foe authorized the native functionaries to offer the leader of the insurrection not only his life and liberty but also a remunerative post in the local administration on the condition that he would come in with his men and deliver up his arms and ammunition these negotiations fell through however for de tam refused all offers made to him and wrote several letters to the french authorities in which he informed them in his usual high-flown bombastic style that he would never surrender and that he still possessed the utmost confidence in the ultimate success of the cause he represented notwithstanding these assertions it is very probable that he would gladly have accepted the terms offered had he been certain of enjoying a quiet and comfortable life after his capitulation but he was too well versed in the natural cunning of his race not to know full well that in the event of his surrender his very existence would be a cause of constant dread to his former associates the mandarins of the court of hui and they would most certainly find a way of ensuring his silence by means both wily and rapid in the use of which orientals are experts from papers captured by the french troops when they surprised the encampment at quin lo a few weeks later it was learnt that the chief had decided on the construction of a new series of defensive positions in this region with the intention of carrying on the rebellion with something like its former success his desires in this respect were however doomed to disappointment for such was the constant activity of the troops occupying the different parts in the upper yen Te, that no rest or respite were allowed him or his men when the main expedition had been broken up at the end of march general voyon had given orders for the permanent occupation of the fortified positions at mo trang and mona luang these two forts which had both been captured from the enemy by the tai nguyen column were well constructed and they required but little labor mainly in the direction of felling the trees that were too close up to the ramparts to make them almost impregnable when properly garrisoned for several months after the conclusion of the principal operations the troops from these two forts together with the men from nha nam and bo ha chased de tam from one hiding-place to another and in consequence he was never able to establish any permanent centre of resistance early in may my section was relieved by a similar detachment of the legion from tai nguyen and we left bo ha for good this time and returned to our company at nha nam on the tenth of the same month we were assembled under arms to witness the departure of captain plessier who was leaving for haiphong whence he sailed for france a few days later our new commander captain watrin took over the company and escorted his predecessor as far as cao tuong 
though the officer who was leaving us had always been a severe disciplinarian unsparing in regard to the work he had required of us yet his departure was a cause of chagrin to his legionaries and their rough though heartfelt expressions of regret were numerous and outspoken none of the officers are allowed to remain more than three consecutive years in tonkin though they can return there after a sojourn with their regiment in algeria our captain had completed his period of colonial service so that he could not have remained longer with us even had he desired so to do officers of his stamp that is men whose bravery is undisputed who are severe but also anxious for the welfare of the troops under their orders will always be popular with the legionaries his successor eventually became an even greater favorite with the company for besides the qualities mentioned already he had a real affection for his men though when the occasion required it he tempered this sentiment with necessary sternness he regarded his command as a family of which he was proud to be the head and made no show of the taciturn aloofness which had characterized his predecessor captain watron who was about thirty-eight years of age was a splendid specimen of humanity for he was tall broad-shouldered and extremely powerful fair with blue eyes and a ruddy complexion he was a typical son of the lost provinces and the fact of his being a native of a village near strasbourg added not a little to his popularity with the numerous alsatians in the company he seemed to take a real pleasure in making himself acquainted with the individual joys and sorrows of his men whenever the chance offered itself he would question us discreetly concerning our private hopes and ambitions and do his best to prove to his subordinates that he was to them not only a chief inflexible as far as questions of discipline were concerned but also a friend to whom they could confide their troubles ever ready with a word of consolation or advice and all the aid it lay in his power to render his inquiries were probably distasteful to such of the men as possessed a past they did not care to recall but when he perceived that a private was reluctant to confide in him he was too tactful to insist on the subject and would smooth matters over by a cheerful et bien mon brave when you want a confessor come to me i may perhaps be able to help you a few weeks after his arrival he was able to address every private in his company by name a trait which is exceedingly rare with the officers in the french army there is no doubt that the men were very grateful to him for this detail which certainly proved that their chief was aware the legionary was not merely an enfant perdu to be known only by the number stamped on each article of his kit but that he recognized that his men like the rest of mankind possessed their just share of pride and passion vice and virtue he very soon showed us that his military talents were of sterling quality for in his first engagements with the enemy it was at once evident that his dispositions for the attack were taken with great coolness and forethought and with the careful intention of avoiding all wanton loss of life during the final rush and scrimmage he was ever to the fore and would not be denied the place of honour at the head of the assault which he led with no other weapon than a thick stick our company was kept continually on the move during the months of may and june reconnaissance and ambuscades being of daily occurrence often we would make a night march and operating in conjunction with parties sent out from the other forts rush at dawn a village in which several of the rebels had passed the night or capture an encampment situated in some out-of-the-way corner of the forest or hidden in a narrow jungle-covered defile between tall steep hills our ambuscades were generally placed on the paths leading to the south by which supplies coming from the few isolated villages still friendly to the rebel cause reached the enemy these expeditions always took place at night for our foes no longer possessed the strength and confidence which had allowed them to move about the country by day as they had been in the habit of doing before the downfall of their citadels to the majority of us the excitement of these little expeditions was a source of real joy 
notwithstanding the dose of fever or twinge of rheumatism that sometimes resulted we enjoyed the silent stealthy march through the dark the long wait hidden in rank jungle with anxious eyes peering through the gloom our fingers on the trigger all listening intently to the thousand soft noises of the night every nerve would be strained to its utmost tension every faculty keenly on the alert the rustle of the long grass as a deer or wild hog moved cautiously through it the breaking of a twig the hoot of an owl or even the sudden shrill chirp of the cicala would make the heart leap with expectation so that its hurried throb sent the blood coursing through the arteries and the system would tingle again under a wave of suppressed excitement more often than not our expectation would be disappointed for the enemy failed to put in an appearance though now and again our patience would be rewarded by a scrimmage and a convoy would be captured and several rebels slain or taken once our ambuscade was surrounded and suddenly rushed by a strong band of most determined chinese banditti of whose presence in the region we were unaware it is probable that they were going south with a convoy of contraband opium a desperate hand-to-hand -hand struggle took place in the dark one of our men was killed in the first charge and several were wounded one of the latter a bugler died of his injuries a few days later it is difficult to surmise what would have been the result of the combat had not another detachment of our men which had been posted at a small ford about half a mile away come to our assistance for we were completely surrounded and owing to the blackness of the night we could hardly distinguish our foes who were cunning enough not to make use of their rifles attacking us instead at close quarters with their heavy swords on finding themselves charged in the rear the celestials withdrew and at daybreak we found six of their dead on or near the position all these had been slain by the bayonet for there had been but little firing on our side since owing to the danger of shooting our friends it had been found necessary to keep to steel though our adventure lasted only a few minutes i think those of us who escaped unhurt from the malay were passing thankful when it was over for never was it better proved that if in warfare an ambuscade can cause great hurt to an enemy who comes upon it unawares that same ambuscade is in danger of total destruction should the enemy be forewarned of its presence at this time thanks to the experience they had acquired during the past year and a half and also to their having been employed during the past three months in continually chasing the enemy from place to place through the wildest country it is possible to imagine the men of my company had become splendid jungle fighters each of them was by now not only a hardened almost fever-proof soldier but also a good shot and an efficient scout ever on the alert to notice each sign by the way to catch each sound in the air and understand their meaning a footprint a broken twig a tiny streak of smoke creeping up from between the trees to the sky the dull thud of the distant axe as it hit the wood and the hundred and one other trifling indications of the passage of man in the tangle of forest-covered hills were at once seized upon and put to profit conversant with the enemy's methods of fighting in the dark glades and sombre thickets of his favourite haunts the legionaries and their officers had learnt to trust no longer to the paths but to advance silently yet swiftly through the undergrowth taking advantage of every bit of cover and making of each tree in the wood each rise in the ground a temporary rampart encouraged by their officers the men took great delight in this new sport which seemed more like a hunt in which the quarry was man than regular warfare the fact of their not being continually in touch with their officers and non-coms and having consequently to depend sometimes on their own resources developed their individual initiative and self-reliance whilst the novelty of the situation gave full scope to their courage and love of adventure 
perhaps with troops possessing less stamina and morale even these short periods of independent action would have been dangerous but with these well-disciplined and seasoned soldiers of the legion this new method of attack seemed rather to increase the zeal and self-confidence of the men the following statement drawn up by a rebel deserter the written translation of which still exists most probably in the records at the headquarters of the second brigade will give some idea of how hard pressed were datam and his faithful few by our troops at this period the favorite wife of our old chief Dadnam was heavy with child when the fire from the big guns and the approach of your infantry at such great numbers obliged us to evacuate our positions notwithstanding her condition she accompanied de tam and his lieutenants de truat and de huay into the great forest at quinlo here she gave birth to a male child posthumous son of our former leader this was on the second day of the fifth month may twenty sixth at this time there were but few men with de tam for the majority of our troops had been scattered all over the country and many had gone south to their villages thus we were but sixty men armed with rifles and with us were seven women and two little ones we had plenty to eat for we drew rice from the secret hiding-places in the forest where great store of this food had been placed many months before by the wise orders of our own lord who was dead but the white soldiers left us no peace and each day they pressed us so hard that we dared not sleep two nights in the same place at last we found a cave to reach which we had to descend a passage leading straight down into the earth in this district are to be found numerous workings of former iron mines which were abandoned several centuries ago and are now overgrown with jungle it is probably to one of these that the deserter made allusion we had been in hiding in this place for several days when a party of soldiers who had followed the tracks of one of our men who had been sent out to fetch water nearly discovered our retreat these soldiers hunted for us until sundown and remained all the night in the forest so that knowing this and fearing lest the cries of the young child should betray us de tam ordered us to dig a hole and in it the nam's son was buried alive when the mother was told of what had befallen her babe for it had been taken from her while she was sleeping and she knew not where it had gone she was stricken with much sorrow and went away from us weeping and complaining into the forest where she slew herself in the agony of her grief on the morrow when the troops had moved off a little we succeeded in getting away further into the jungle the ninth june nineteen o two i happened to be with a scouting party and came upon the body of the dead woman it was still warm and a native knife embedded right up to the hilt had pierced the heart like the rest of my comrades i imagined at the time that this unfortunate creature had been murdered by the rebels and it was only several weeks later when assisting at the examination of the deserter mentioned above that i learned what had really happened on my return to nha nam in may i had been glad to renew relations with my friend doi to and whenever i found time to do so i passed my evening in his kanya and seated beside him as he smoked talked over the situation he was always very well informed on all that was going on though he most certainly owed much of his knowledge to his former enemy but now devoted friend lin yi who since the termination of the main operations had been nominated to the important post of lu tuong headman of the village of long tuong and in return for the services he had rendered to the authorities important stretches of cultivated land formerly owned by some of the rebels had been made over to him it was from to that i learned of the lasting impression which the rapid capture of all de tam's fortifications had produced upon the population of the yente 
the majority of the people, he said, were no longer moved to enthusiasm by this chief's appeal to their patriotism, and they now possessed no confidence in the ultimate success of the movement in favor of their exiled monarch. However, my friend was never weary of repeating that until the French succeeded in killing or capturing de Tam, the chief would be a source of constant trouble in the region, because most of the peasants possessed such a real dread of him that but few of the villages would dare to refuse his demands for money or rice, so long as he remained an outlaw, and had at his disposal a band of cruel and determined partisans though i think that tho was glad of my company it was evident to me that he was chagrined at my continued refusal to become a votary of the soothing drug which like the majority of his compatriots he regarded as one of the necessities of existence his disgust at my persistence was all the more intense because it was an open secret that several of the french officers and sergeants serving in the native regiments smoked opium and took but little pains to conceal the fact he would give me as examples the names of his superiors who indulged in the pleasure procured by the subtle poison hoping to induce me to follow their example though curiously enough he would generally conclude his exhortations with quaint reflections full of irony concerning the excess to which most of the europeans who indulged in this passion would go and he would then in grandiloquent terms replete with oriental conceit inform me that he was himself complete master of his own desires he would swell with pride and delight when to humour him i would praise his powers of self-control though for the matter of that i was convinced the length of his purse and the veto of ba his wife had more to do with the number of pipes he smoked than any check he was himself capable of imposing on his cravings he would speak at length on this subject bringing out his words with a slow drawling sing-song cadence in which there was no indication of emotion though now and again when he had given an opinion he considered was possessed of more than ordinary value he would pause somewhat longer than necessary watching me intently the while to see if i had fully grasped the sense of his argument and appreciated the beauty of his flowery metaphor yes friend he would say tell me i beg you has not heaven given to us men the different pleasures of life so that we shall draw from them delight wherewith to lighten our troubles and to forget our hardships indeed you do know since i myself told it to you that our wise men have long since decided that these numerous and varied pleasures can be classified according to their merits which consist in the degree of bliss they can procure us each of these emotions finds its proper place in its proper section which last is itself one of the seven joys even as a soldier has his appointed position in one of the four battalions of his regiment the ancients represented the seven joys by as many bats because like our pleasures these animals flit around us in eccentric curves though it requires but a little patience and a light blow to bring them to our feet that is why in our pagodas our houses and upon the altars to our ancestors you will always see sculptured or painted the seven bats which are the seven joys heaven has sent us a thousand flowers of which the most beautiful is the sacred lotus so that we should admire their colours and shape glory in their scent and draw great joy therefrom also the splendour of our hills our forests and our rivers the beauty of our women the love of our little ones the pleasures of the chase and the gladness in the slaughter of our foes are only a few of the million joys in life amongst which en tout fun, lord opium is not the least in importance and these blessings have been generously accorded us by the lord buddha himself and any refusal to participate in them is indeed rank blasphemy 
but be warned that in all things there must be moderation and because of our friendship i would not see you do like the ong guang hai lieutenant i have already spoken of for if his orderly speaks not lies this young man smokes one hundred and twenty pipes each day which is a great foolishness indeed for in this way his pleasure is no longer his servant to come and go at his bidding but rather he has become the slave of his pleasure neither is his case an exception for nearly all you western foreigners are alike in this matter and ever you go to the extremes either you will not touch the drug most probably because you are afraid of yourselves or if you once begin you will increase each day the number of pipes you smoke until your pleasure kills you instead of remaining content with a moderate use of it in speaking thus to was but echoing the opinion of his compatriots for the inhabitants of indo-china like the chinese are convinced of their superiority so far as intelligence is concerned over the european partly from curiosity and also because i was determined to show this little brown man that i possessed more self-restraint than he gave me credit for i consented one evening to make the experiment and smoked four pipes i was rewarded by a most violent headache prolonged nausea and a sleepless night crowded with waking nightmare it is hardly necessary to add that i did not repeat the experiment and though for some time to persisted in telling me that i had not given the drug a fair trial he finally dropped the subject but it is probable that my inability to partake of his favorite pleasure was to him another proof of the decided inferiority of the european end of chapter seven part one chapter seven of a soldier of the legion by george mannington this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven part two about the middle of june lieutenant deleuze the intelligence officer from tai nguyen to which reference was made in a preceding chapter came to us to assist in the operations that were going on for owing to his knowledge of the vernacular of the natives and their customs he was able to obtain information when others less gifted would most certainly have failed this officer was also instructed to complete a new map of the region for the late expedition had brought to light the many errors and omissions contained in the former surveys of the province my friend lipte accompanied the lieutenant for he was to assist in the topographical work i was pleased indeed to see my friend again and was happy at being able to congratulate him on his recent promotion for he was now a corporal and we wetted his stripes on the evening of his arrival with several bottles of good wine in confidence he informed me that i was myself to be attached to the intelligence staff of the district and though he disclaimed all knowledge of the cause i soon found out that i owed this chance of promotion to his good offices i knew little at the time what important changes in my existence this new departure would bring me though had i possessed that knowledge it could hardly have increased my gratitude for the good turn my chum had done me for a month i worked with lieutenant deleuze and accompanied the different reconnaissances and little columns making rough surveys of the ground covered and bringing back the sketches to nha nam where they were amplified and checked during these expeditions i was mounted on a native pony and armed with a carbine instead of the longer and less handy rifle my new life was a most agreeable one for not only did i escape all the drudgery of fatigue duties in the fort but when the reconnaissance with which i might happen to be out got in touch with the enemy i would put away my compass and planchette and do duty as a galloper carrying information from the scouts to the commanding officer and going back again with orders my mount was only eleven and a half hands in height so that when i was in the saddle my feet were but a few inches from the ground but the animal's pluck endurance and sure-footedness were extraordinary 
on the fifteenth july lipte together with the other members of the district staff returned to te nguyen i was left behind as my employment had only been a temporary one but i continued to do topographical work for our captain and was in consequence spared the ordinary company routine owing to the extreme heat which had now set in the authorities gave orders for the suspension of all operations except in case of great urgency so that nothing more exciting went on than an occasional hour of drill or theoretical instruction having failed to capture datam while it was still possible to move the troops the authorities were now obliged to wait for cooler weather within the redui or little citadel of our fort a military telegraph office had been erected communicating with bo ha and tai nguyen by wire and with mo trang and mo na luang by the heliograph two french operators a marine and a gunner were in charge of the station since i had been detached on special service i had messed with these two telegraphists and it was not long before we were the best of friends bougand the marine and Grémaire, the gunner were parisians of good family and education and thanks to their natural versatility and wit we soon found means of introducing a certain amount of fun into our existence which helped to relieve the terrible monotony of life in the fort by nailing a damp sheet over a window which gave upon the gun platform and with the aid of a powerful lamp sometimes used for signalling at night we started a shadow theatre our troop and scenery we cut out of thick cardboard and we were able to present adaptations of some of the most popular dramas and comedies of the day the text and mise en scene of which would have been a startling revelation to the original authors these performances were given twice a week and lasted from seven thirty till nine p m and our audience was composed of all the legionaries not on duty and such of the native troops as cared to attend there was of course no accommodation for the spectators who were indeed above such details and they contented themselves with standing or squatting upon the hard ground to watch the show though some of our audience saw fit to make rude remarks concerning the tone of voice in which the feminine roles were read the majority were unsparing of their applause and the appearance of the silhouettes of such famous artists as the golden-voiced sarah or the two coquelins brought down the house now and again some ready-witted interruption from one of the spectators would cause the temporary disappearance of the actors from the stage and a momentary cessation of the performance for unable to control our emotions or continue the dialogue we would fall on the floor of the little mat shed hut where we would lie convulsed with laughter until the noisy public threatened to pull down the house unless we continued the play success oft-times breeds foolhardiness and in an evil hour finding that we had exhausted the repertoire our memories offered us of plots from the parisian stage we decided to draw on local incidents for the construction of our plays at first all went well for such farces as the de tom's defeat in which that chief after refusing the hand of the governor-general's daughter and a big dowry died through incautiously tasting the contents of a tin of bully beef supplied by the commissariat for the use of the troops were successful and produced no untoward results but craving for still greater popularity we were foolish enough to put upon our stage the two transparently caricatured counterpart of one of the senior non-commissioned officers in the company of native troops who though an excellent soldier was possessed of many eccentricities this veteran resented our impudence and we were reported and obliged to suspend our performances the instruments were placed in the upper story of the little telegraph station and i was in the habit of sitting upstairs for a couple of hours each evening with either of my friends who happened to be on duty here we would chat and smoke for the messages were few and far between after eight and while away the time till eleven on the evening of twenty second may i was there as usual 
bougand was on duty and we had been exchanging opinions concerning the adjutant who had succeeded in obtaining the clôture of our theatre when our conversation was suddenly interrupted by a call on the morse from tai nguyen in the middle of the message he was receiving my companion gave a sudden whoop of astonishment though this did not cause me much emotion for i was accustomed by now to his pet mania which consisted in telling me all sorts of tall stories concerning the wires he received and i prepared myself to greet a yarn about the capture of de tam or my promotion to the much desired dignity of a full-blown corporal when the message was finished and he had rapped back that he had read the same correctly he jumped up excitedly came over to me and holding out his hand shouted mon vieux i congratulate you blagueur i answered spare me your mouldy joke it's much too hot to laugh so be sensible let's take a glass of wine if any remains in the bottle and then i'll go to bed i assure you he almost yelled it but i would not let him go on and taunted him with the staleness of the joke he was trying to play till in despair of obtaining a hearing he rushed over to the instrument tore off the band and handed it to me to read to my amazement i saw clearly printed in little blue letters upon the narrow strip of paper beyond the possibility of a hoax the following message major tai nguyen to captain commanding no nam send soldier mannington by first convoy to fu long tuang from whence he will proceed to bac ninh to take service as secretary brigade staff the next few minutes were exciting ones and it was not until we had hauled gramaire from his bed downstairs communicated the news to him and drowned our emotion in a jugful of wine and water with a lemon cut up in it that things began to assume their normal proportions i slept but little that night and lay speculating as to how it was that fortune had so favoured me for a berth on the staff meant interesting work extra pay and comfortable quarters in fact a return to partial civilization the change carried with it one drawback however which made me hesitate as to whether it would not be better for me to propose another man in my place for i knew that promotion was very slow on the brigade the number of non-coms there being limited to three and i was already somewhat disappointed at not receiving my stripes at the same time as my friend lipte though this had been owing to the fact that several corporals had been sent out to the corps with the last batch of troops from algeria so that the vacancies had been few and only the best had been chosen next morning i was called up to the rapport and after captain watrin had informed me of the order received from our major i told him of my fears but he would not listen to them at length and informed me that i must go that he was proud that a man from his company had been chosen and that i might congratulate myself on my good luck why mon garçon he said you have only to do your work well and keep sober and you will do that i know for the honour of the company and promotion will come in good time in two years you will probably be a sergeant and then if you so choose you will be able to go to st martin the military school for sergeants who wish to become officers and get a commission now go to the sergeant major and get your foyer de route for you will leave with the convoy to boha to-morrow morning then offering me his hand this excellent man and true gentleman said now good luck to you and be careful to remember always that you belong to the legion and that the honour of the corps is yours also after packing my kit and getting my papers from the sergeant major who chaffed me good-naturedly by saying that now that i was going to be on intimate terms with a general he hoped i would not put on too much side i went round the company to say good-bye later i slipped away to to's hut in the native village and told him of my coming departure 
the little man was evidently chagrined at the news nevertheless he congratulated me most heartily and made me promise to write to him saying with evident pride that he was now able to read a little french so that with the aid of one of the native clerks in the commissariat department he would be able to decipher my letters we had a grand dinner that evening in the little telegraph station a tin of salmon and several bottles of beer having been purchased to swell the menu provided by our usual rations my friends drank to my success and i to their health and speedy return to france and it was late in the night before i retired to rest for the last time in the fort which had with few intervals been my home for the past fifteen months several of my comrades were present to bid me god speed when early the next morning i filed out with a convoy through the gates of our position together with several sick men both legionaries and tirailleurs, who were going down to the hospital i left boha that evening we descended the river in sampans and reached fulang duong next morning on the morning of the twenty sixth july i left for bac ninh with the weekly convoy to hanoi which carried the mails we passed through dap cao at noon and arrived at our destination at two p m the country we traversed was a big cultivated plain dotted with villages with here and there occasional small groups of low hills at bac ninh there is a small citadel built no doubt towards the end of the eighteenth century by one of the engineers lent by louis the sixteenth to his ally the emperor of Annam. it is hexagonal in shape and constructed according to the principles of vauban each of its sides has a frontage of about a thousand yards and is furnished with numerous flanking bastions and demi lunes there was a company of marines a battalion of the third regiment of tirailleurs tonkinois and about a thousand militia in garrison there inside the citadel were the houses of the general commanding the second brigade the resident of the province the officers quarters the barracks of the troops the staff offices and the lodgings of the soldier secretary on my arrival i reported to the brigade major captain michaud who sent me on with an orderly to the intelligence department where i was to be employed the chief of this office lieutenant cassier received me very kindly and after telling one of the secretaries a marine to go and show me where our lodgings were situated he informed me that i might rest that afternoon and come to work the next morning i found that i was quartered together with the other scribes five privates and two corporals in a one-roomed brick building with a veranda in front which was situated at the end of the general's garden and looked out into the parade ground of the native infantry on the other side of this open space about three hundred yards away were the buildings occupied by the french marines i washed disposed my kit above the cot which i noted was of the comfortable pattern in use in algeria and went for a stroll into the town about a couple of hundred yards outside the fortifications for i desired to reconnoitre the surroundings before dinner which i had been informed was six p m the little town of bac ninh is situated on the old mandarin road from hanoi the capital of tonkin to lang son and the chinese frontier about eighteen miles from the metropolis it contains a population of eight thousand natives is the capital of the province of the same name and has a cathedral seat of the spanish bishopric of eastern tonkin though it is not a manufacturing centre of any importance its only local production being silk embroidery work for which however it is famous it is considered as one of the principal commercial towns of the colony because its markets are a medium of barter or exchange for objects imported from the surrounding provinces and also from china through the frontier towns of lang son and Khao bang i wandered through the narrow streets for an hour or so and was delighted with the life and bustle of the little town it was market day and the busy throngs jostled one another as they passed to and fro the natives are noisy individuals and their shrill cries as they hawked their wares or wrangled over the price of some article for household use 
a basket of rice yams or some other comestible were perfectly bewildering at first to me for i had become so used to the silence of the empty plains and the jungle-covered hills that even the tiny stir of this overgrown village produced an impression akin to what an inhabitant of exmoor might feel were he suddenly transported to the busiest centre of london i got back in good time to the citadel for i was anxious not to commit so serious a breach of etiquette as to make my new comrades await dinner for me i received a hearty welcome from them all though only one of them a lance corporal who was working in the general office belonged to the legion he came from the second regiment we sat down to our meal in a small building close to the offices of the brigade and the fare which was better than i had been used to at nha nam and the unexpected luxuries of china plates and real glasses a table covered with white oilcloth and a punka were more than sufficient to reconcile me to my new surroundings owing to the extra pay we drew about one and sixpence a day it was not only possible to keep up a good mess but besides the cook we were able to maintain a boy at four piastres a month about eight shillings and this faithful servitor swept out our quarters made the beds cleaned our boots pipe clayed our helmets and performed a hundred and one other services which i had become so used to doing for myself that it was several days before i could become accustomed to leave the work to him much to the amusement of the other secretaries the morning after my arrival i rose and dressed at five thirty a m as i had been used to do in my company but i got roundly sworn at by the other occupants of the room for awakening them by my noisy ablutions the fault lay with them however for they had neglected to inform me that the office opened at eight though it was several weeks before i could accustom myself to lie abed till seven each morning i found that my work consisted partly in aiding in the drawing up of a new map of yen te and partly in clerical and intelligence work this last part was the most interesting for i had to write down the reports of the different spies attached to the brigade and the deposition of the captured brigands when they were interrogated by the lieutenant in charge of our office besides this i had to pass an hour each morning with the brigade major as it was my duty to register all the correspondence received the letters and reports being handed over to me for that purpose by captain michaud as soon as he had perused them by this means i became acquainted with everything of interest that was going on in the colony so far as rebellion brigandage and military operations were concerned and i had not been long on the staff before i realized that the little warfare in which my company had taken a part in the yen te was but a chapter in the history of a struggle that was still going on all over the country outside of the delta provinces between the french on one hand and the tonkinese rebels and chinese bands on the other columns were marching or being organized against such chiefs as lung Ki, whose powerful gangs of well-armed plunderers overran the provinces of Quang Yen, Lam, and Lang Son. The veteran banditti of the quasi-feudal lords Ba Ki and Luang Tam Ki, in the districts of Khao Bang and Ha Gien, on the higher reaches of the Red River, and the frontiers of Yunnan, Quang Si, and Quang Tung, and skirmishes were reported daily by the officers who commanded the various forts and blockhouses whose garrisons were continually coming in touch with the bands infesting the mountainous regions of the colony End of chapter seven part two Chapter Eight of A Soldier of the Legion by George Mannington. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight, Part One. General Voyon, organization of the brigade, piracy on the Long Son Railway, politics and pacification, topography and a tiger hunt, among the staff records. Colonel Gallieni, General Penot, Hanoi, General Coronat death of a friend adieu to the army 
time dealt gently with the able officer who was in command of the second brigade at bac Nguyen in eighteen ninety two for this general when at the head of the french corps serving ten years later with the allied army under marshal valdesse in china was still the same thick-set active soldier whose rugged features bespoke the energy and determination of the man and whose eyes held the genial light which did not belie the kindly nature of the soul within throughout the whole of his long career this officer was associated with france's colonial army as a young officer he was severely wounded at the defence of bazier in eighteen seventy he served afterwards under Fideurbe in the soudan and senegal and with brière de lille in tonkin the man in the ranks of all armies is never at a loss to find an appropriate nickname for a superior who appeals to his regard or dislike and this general had not been long in command before he became known to the men in the french and foreign battalions alike as papa voiron it would indeed have been difficult to find another cognomen conveying with equal truthfulness the just firm and fatherly manner in which he treated the troops under his orders it is a pleasure to do justice to the high military capabilities and admirable characteristics of this popular french officer but it must nevertheless be stated that the speech made by general voyon at marseilles on his return from peking in nineteen o two containing as it did several adverse and unmerited criticisms on the discipline and courage of our indian troops was a source of some surprise to me however when one takes into consideration that of late years politics have unfortunately occupied a predominant place in the minds of france's most capable military men and also that public feeling was unfavourable to england at the time this speech was made it may be assumed that these aspersions which tally badly with the character of the gallant officer were but the result of a passing wave of popular sentiment to the effects of which the gallic temperament is always so susceptible Acceptable. the commandant of the brigade like many others of his profession possessed a hobby as far removed from le métier des hommes as the not infrequent desire fostered by many old merchant skippers for keeping a poultry farm is from the art of navigation this hobby was horticulture it should be mentioned that during the cooler months of each year in tonkin october to april all the edible green stuffs of the temperate zones can be grown with success though to obtain really good results fresh seed must be procured annually from europe general voyon made it his special care that all the stations in the interior where white troops were garrisoned should possess a kitchen garden thanks to this wise measure the men to the benefit alike of their health and palate were and are still supplied during six months out of twelve with abundant quantities of fresh vegetables and the quality of the crops obtained from the trim well-kept gardens is a cause of emulation in each of these small garrisons whenever the general inspected the different forts situated in the regions under his care he never failed to look round these gardens and when they showed proof that care had been bestowed upon them he was lavish in his expressions of satisfaction but there would be a mauvais moment à passer for the unfortunate officer who had neglected or ignored the brigadier's circulars containing recommendations concerning the necessity of ensuring a liberal supply of vegetables for the men the internal organization of the brigade staff was very simple there were three departments the first being the general office the staff of which was charged with the elucidation of all questions relating to administration promotion and discipline in the corps belonging to the brigade the printing and dispatching of general orders and circulars and the drawing up of the monthly reports concerning the available effectives the existing stocks of arms and ammunition and the general health of the troops 
the intelligence department was the second section and the duties of its chief were both numerous and delicate some of the most important being the control of the surveying and topographical bureau the interrogation of spies or prisoners and administration of the secret service funds the translation of code telegrams the classification of the documents relative to the active operations of the brigade and the editing of the monthly confidential reports concerning the existing bands of rebels and brigands which gave detailed information as to their organization approximate strength armament and zones of action the third department was the office of the brigade major through which all completed work passed for inspection and annotation before being transmitted to the general for signature and from which the first two sections received instructions the chief of the staff who was at the head of this office was also charged with the transmission of the general's decisions relative to punishments or censure inflicted on officers under his orders and to his care were entrusted the confidential notes concerning each of these subordinates these notes consisted of information concerning the past services punishments special aptitudes or failings as the case might be of each officer in the brigade and were contained in a little parchment-covered book known as the livret individual on the outside of which was written the name of the person it concerned one such book is made out for every sub-lieutenant as soon as he passes out of st cyr and obtains his commission and this little tell-tale record follows him from corps to corps during the whole of his career it will be easily understood that it is considered a matter of extreme importance that no officer should ever become acquainted with the contents of his livret individual and to this effect the only persons who are allowed to handle them are the commandant of his regiment who notes therein every six months his appreciations of his subordinates military capabilities and moral conduct the chief of the brigade staff and the general the secretaries on the brigade took turns on night duty for it was necessary that a man should be at the office from six p m to six a m to receive the telegrams when they arrived and in event of their being of urgent importance to send them on to the chief of staff we were so busy in the intelligence department that in the first week in september the major decided to get another man so as to relieve me and aid in the topographical work to my delight lipte was chosen for the post so that a few days later i was able to welcome my old chum into his new quarters this increase in work was due to the state of affairs on the railway then in construction from fulang tuang to lang son for the region was overrun by bands of chinese brigands under the orders of the famous lui Qi, who attacked the working parties and carried away into captivity several of the french engineers and contractors encouraged by their success the robbers ambuscaded several of the convoys going by road to lang son and after slaying the majority of the escort carried off important quantities of treasure several cases of la belle rifles and a good deal of ammunition in one of these engagements a major of the infanterie de marine commandant bonneau was shot dead so great was the mobility of these bands and such excellent cover was offered by the mountainous country on either side of the road that all attempts to engage and scatter them made by the little parties of troops garrisoned in the different forts proved of no avail and it soon became evident that it would require a strong and well-organized column to secure any favorable results to ensure the security of the route and to allow of the work upon the railway being continued in august general rest the commander-in-chief at hanoi made an urgent appeal to the governor-general for permission to undertake operations against lui Qi on a scale to ensure success but m de lanessan refused to countenance any such movement and declared that the military authorities ought to be able to crush the bands with the forces already at their disposal in garrison along the lanson route there is little doubt that the governor in making this reply was influenced by political motives 
The recent successful operations in the Yen Thé had been utilized to further his political aspirations in France, and the metropolitan press had repeatedly announced, with a great flourish of trumpets, that rebellion and brigandage were now dead in Tonkin. Indeed, in one of his reports to the colonial minister, M. de Lanasson had declared that owing to the success of his administration, the pacification of the colony was now an assured fact, and it was possible to wander over the country with no other protection than a stout walking-stick. The absurdity of such statements was clear in Tonkin, but they found favor with the public in France, where people were only too willing to believe that an era of peace and plenty was at last to open in their far eastern possessions, with a consequent cessation of the enormous sacrifice of men and money that had accompanied the past ten years. The governor, because of this advertisement, was declared to be the first of France's viceroys capable of grappling with the situation, and as it was his firm intention to again contest in the near future the seat in the chamber which he had resigned on accepting the high position he was now filling, he can hardly be blamed, in a country where men take up politics as a business, for fostering interest which would assure him a considerable number of votes when the time came. That this state of affairs was detrimental to the progress of the colony is certain, but political influence, party hatred, and electioneering jobbery have had much to do with retarding the development of Indochina, since its administration was placed in the hands of a civilian governor and staff in 1886. It is, however, possible that the governor made these declarations in good faith, for he had hardly been a year in the country, and was obliged to rely for advice on the residents and vice-residents, and these civilians, hating the military element, were only too eager to throw doubts on the exactitude of the information contained in the reports coming in from the military territories and they openly declared that the officers of the colonial army were intentionally exaggerating the gravity of the situation in the hope of provoking operations likely to bring them promotion and decorations the contradictory advice of this civilian staff was possibly one of the causes which led the governor to pooh-pooh the importance of this new upheaval declaring that the generals were alarmist and that the well-armed and organized bands of Ruiqui were que de valeur de vache pour venir au bout desquels il souffrait de quelques gendarmes only cattle stealers with whom a few policemen could deal these declarations provoked the anger and disgust of every officer and man in the colony and very soon a veritable hatred reigned between the civil and military elements the different newspapers sided with the parties appealing most to their sentiments or their pockets for it was an open secret that some of these journals were subventioned by the government and a wordy warfare wherein neither insults nor invective were spared was the order of the day doubtless there were faults on both sides and it is certain that the commander-in-chief committed an unpardonable error by issuing general orders to the troops to be read at parades and posted up in the barracks in which the civilian authorities were belittled and reproached with having insulted the army this necessarily added fuel to the fire and the situation became so strained that officers and civilians came to fisticuffs in the streets of the capital, and several serious duels took place. Things were, however, brought to a climax towards the ends of August by the abduction of three Frenchmen on the railway line, one of whom, M. Vezin, was the principal engineer representing the big contracting firm, Lille and company the consternation in high quarters when this news was received was considerable for there existed no possible chance of keeping such thrilling information out of the newspapers in paris as soon as the coup had been successfully carried through 
Liu Qi retired into the security of his lair in the mountains of the Bao Day range, and from here he sent out messengers to the nearest military station, announcing that he would release the prisoners on the receipt of a sum of a hundred thousand dollars in silver. But he also declared that, in event of the troops approaching his encampment, he would have the captives executed immediately. The excitement throughout the colony was intense and party rancor was forgotten in the general anxiety felt for the three unfortunate prisoners, as the cruelty of the Chinese bandits was well known to all. After three weeks of negotiation, a slight reduction in the ransom was obtained, and the three gentlemen were released, after having suffered indignity and torture at the hands of their captors, with the result that their constitutions were wrecked, by privation and exposure. The governor still refused, however, to authorize effective operations against the robbers, and it was not until several military convoys had been captured and a good many officers and men slain that Monsieur de la Nasson finally agreed that the bandits were worthy of more serious attention than they had previously received. When the column actually commenced operations, its work was considerably facilitated by the death of the famous chief Louis Qui from the effects of a wound received during the attack made on the convoy when Major Bonneau was killed. But owing to the rugged nature of the country in which the operations took place, it was fully six weeks before the brigands were defeated and scattered. A good many of the bandits escaped to Quang Si, and others fled to the mountainous region in the north. The telegrams and reports coming in from the column were of great interest to me, as my company was taking part in the Batu. I happened to be on night duty one evening, towards the end of September, when a wire was received stating that a detachment of my comrades had been caught in an ambuscade among the rocky defiles of the Kai Kin, at a point not far from Cho Trang, my former garrison. This dispatch mentioned that Captain Watran, our commander, was among the slain. Both Lipte and myself were shocked at this news. We experienced, however, a certain relief on hearing next day that the body of our chief had not fallen into the hands of the enemy, though seven of the men were hit while carrying the corpse out of the narrow defile to a place of safety. Several months later I met a man who had assisted at this engagement, and he informed me that the legionaries went raving mad when they learned that this popular officer was killed and after rushing the position, to gain which they had to pass one at a time down a sort of narrow funnel fifty feet long, swept by the enemy's fire, they slew every Chinaman found behind the improvised ramparts. Our losses were very heavy, owing to the strength of the position, but the men would not be denied and took a terrible revenge for the death of their captain. In October the rebel chief began to give trouble again. He made overtures for peace, and, profiting by the confidence thus inspired, and the absence of the majority of the troops from the region, he left his retreat in the forest, and captured and occupied a strongly fortified village called Ban Kuk, about ten miles south of Nha Nam. He established his headquarters there, and ravaged the surrounding district, until a fortnight later he was driven from his fastness by a column under Major Barr, and again escaped to the mountains with the majority of his men. Notwithstanding the hard work we were having on the brigade, time passed agreeably at Baxin, for there was plenty to see in the town when we were off duty that is, for anyone interested in studying the native industries and customs. Besides, to relieve the monotony of garrison life, the general had encouraged the French troops to organize a theatrical troupe which gave some very amusing concerts and dramatic performances in a temporary theater in the barracks, the commandant of the brigade and his staff never failing to attend. In October, General Rest was recalled to France, and General Duchemin took over the supreme command of the troops in the colony, after which the animosity between the civilians and military subsided. 
at this time i was often left in charge of the intelligence department for lieutenant cassier and lipte were away three days in each week making a new survey of the surrounding country during one of these outings they were approached by the headman of a village who begged them to come and slay a man-eating tiger that had established his headquarters in a cluster of trees inside the hamlet itself the beast had been there three days already and each morning had seized upon and devoured one of the unfortunate inhabitants so that the remainder were afraid to leave their houses the natives declared that they had employed every available means of driving the fierce brute away but the beating of drums and gongs the throwing of lances and lighted torches into the scrub had only served to enrage their uninvited guests and that very morning one of the villagers who had approached too near to the thicket had been slain before the eyes of his comrades the officer and my friends taking with them their escort consisting of ten native soldiers and a corporal proceeded at once to the scene of the tragedy the tirailleurs instructed to shout and keep on firing off their rifles in the air from time to time were told to advance upon the little clump of trees from three sides at once while the lieutenant and lipte waited on the other by these means they succeeded in driving the tiger out into the open and he was dispatched with a couple of well-aimed shots i saw the beast when brought into bac Ninh. he was a fine specimen of his kind measuring nine feet seven inches from the tip of the tail to the muzzle at this period of my service i was promoted to the post of archiviste and thus was placed in charge of all the records of the brigade i should mention that at this time they were in a serious state of disorder owing to the negligence of the secretary who had preceded me in this work so that i was obliged to set to and sort the whole of them it was somewhat weary work at first wading through this mass of paper the greater part consisting of musty dust-covered dossiers dating back some of them to the conquest of the country by the french but there were documents of immense interest among this medley of yellow evil-smelling and worm-eaten dispatches and the reconstruction with the aid of all the original reports of the famous march of general de Nerger to lang son and the frontier of china the subsequent retreat to kep and the inquiry prior to the court-martial held on the unfortunate colonel herbinger who took over the command of the troops after the general was wounded at Kilui, was a source of pure joy to me for several days in december general voyon left tonquin for france and colonel gallini later a general and governor of madagascar came down from lang son where he was in command of the first military territory and took over the service par interim the governor-general who had already done away with the brigade at sante thinking no doubt that this was a magnificent occasion to weaken still further the hand of the military party in the colony decided to dispense with another brigadier so he issued a decree abolishing the command at bac Nien probably the fact that the announcement of this step would be hailed in france as another proof of the supposed pacification of the country was an inducement to the taking of this measure it is doubtful from a military standpoint if the change was a wise one for though it saved the colony about forty eight hundred pounds a year the salary of two generals it was hardly possible for the commander-in-chief in hanoi to deal directly with the commandants of the different regiments military territories and garrisons in the delta who were scattered all over so vast a country indeed the insufficiency of the new system was so evident that the authorities eventually returned to the original arrangement and to-day though the country is almost completely pacified there exist two brigades in tonquin and one in cochin china however though m de lanesson planned this important change in the colony the colonial ministry in paris did not look at affairs in the same light as soon as they learned that general voyon was leaving they sent out general pernot to replace him and the latter arrived in indochina to find that the post he had come out to fill no longer existed 
Monsieur de Lanazon would have liked to send the general back to France, and indeed he proposed to do so, but the authorities in Paris, probably because they had no post for the officer at home, insisted that he should remain. Thus the brigade was resuscitated for his benefit, and its secretaries, already on their way to rejoin their respective regiments, were recalled to Bac Ninh. I had been in Phulang Thuong four days, and was awaiting a convoy for Nha Nam, when the order arrived for my return, and its arrival caused me no little surprise and speculation. Two days later I was back in my old place, my absence having lasted about a week, and the following morning General Pernot came up from Hanoi with his staff. He was a short, fat, red-faced man with a very loud, disagreeable voice and a temper that was worse, and his reputation with the men of being a crusty martinet was not altogether unjustified. The day following his arrival he came to the office and passed a review of the secretaries. On learning that I was in charge of the records, he came over to where I was standing at attention and asked, "'You are naturalized, I suppose?' no mon general i answered what not naturalized yet you have the intention of becoming so of course no mon general i replied he glared up at me with an angry stare and his face took a dull red colour i thought he was going to burst oh indeed he blurted out at last you must put in an application to become a french citizen or go back to your battalion I will have no foreigners in a post of confidence on my staff. Grand Dieu! What have they been doing to allow such a thing? It is shameful, nom de nom. He almost shouted the last words, so great was his indignation, and from the expression he put into them one might have been justified in imagining that the Republic was in danger owing to my presence there. I did not become naturalized, and I heard nothing more about the question and in justice to this cantankerous officer i must acknowledge that during the fifteen months he commanded the brigade he treated me with consideration on the rare occasions that i had any direct business to transact with him he had risen from the ranks indeed i was told that he began his career as a sailor on a man-of-war and it is therefore probable that his modest origin and the hard times he experienced at his debut accounted for his rough and rude manners end of chapter eight part one chapter eight of a soldier of the legion by george mannington this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight part two our new brigade major captain bataille was a quiet and reserved gentleman who studied hard at his profession and was a most capable officer having already brilliantly distinguished himself in the field for which he had been decorated with the cross of the legion of honour we had now no intelligence department and all questions formerly dealt with by this branch together with those relating to active operations by the troops were treated by the headquarters staff at hanoi the governor had not succeeded in doing away with the brigade but he had taken his revenge by reducing its importance to a minimum and the role of its chief now consisted almost entirely in looking after the details of administration and discipline of the regiments under his orders and in conducting the annual inspection of the troops in french indochina in january eighteen ninety three we received orders to transfer our offices to hanoi and we had rather a lively time of it for several days packing up the records and stowing them away together with all the portable furniture into a long string of commissariat mule carts our march to hanoi was not a fatiguing one for the distance is not great about twenty miles and the road is probably the best in tonkin owing to the numerous carts we were escorting our progress was not as rapid as it might have been and it was late in the evening when we reached a point on the left bank of the red river just opposite the capital the country we had traversed during the day was perfectly flat and covered with paddy fields and i do not think we saw the smallest patch that was not cultivated the weather was bitterly cold the mercury having descended almost to freezing point 
the winter of ninety two ninety three was a record one in the colony and thrice along the route we came upon the bodies of natives who had died from exposure our convoy was transported over the stream nearly a mile wide at this point by a steam ferry the accommodation on this ferry was so restricted that only two carts could be taken at a time so that it was quite dark when we reached the citadel situated some distance from the landing stage our new offices were inside the fortress a fine place constructed on the same plan as that of bac Ninh, the difference between the two being that the superficial area of the first was twice that of the second these fortifications first captured by the french in eighteen seventy two no longer exist and on the former side of their ramparts and ditches can now be seen one of the finest quarters of the european town hanoi the capital of tonkin was important and imposing when i first saw it in eighteen ninety three and to-day thanks to the enterprise and good taste of its municipal council it is certainly one of the finest cities in the far east its rapid development and flourishing condition leads one to reflect on what the colony itself might be were its destinies placed like those of the metropolis in the hands of a representative chamber of colonists elected by their fellow-citizens instead of being entrusted to an army of political functionaries the city was founded in eight sixty five a d by the emperor cao bien and its original name was dai la tan a succeeding monarch te son constructed a palace there in ten twenty eight hanoi is admirably situated for commercial purposes being at the extreme northern limit of the delta provinces at a point on the river eighty two miles from haiphong where communication with lower tonkin by means of the numerous estuaries and canals is easy and rapid the same may be said with regard to upper tonkin and yunnan which can be reached by the song koi itself the dutch merchants established factories or trading posts there and at huang yen nam din and haiphong towards the end of the sixteenth century hanoi has the form of an isosceles triangle the base of which extends along the river bank for about two miles the inhabitants of the capital owe a good deal to m de lanazan who was the first to suggest the demolition of the immense and useless citadel which owing to its situation retarded the growth of the city northwards the native quarter of the town is extremely picturesque and the neat whitewashed houses not two of which are alike in size or height with their quaintly curved red-tiled roofs and step-like cornices the numerous pagodas ornamented with dragons griffins and genii produce a vista of pleasant aspect and great interest to the european there are hundreds of small shops wherein the natives squat on a piece of matting surrounded by their wares workmen of a like craft merchants in similar lines of business flock together and live in the same quarter so that the majority of the streets in the annamese portion of the town are named after the objects made or for sale there thus it is that one sees at the corners of the thoroughfare such indications as bamboo matting street hat street fan street copper street etc etc the main arteries of this quarter present a crowded appearance and traffic is continual but contrary to the usual state of affairs in most oriental cities the streets are clean and odourless a fact which can be attributed to an excellent system of police supervision the rickshaws is the favourite means of transportation although an admirable system of electric tramways has now been started the native inhabitants of the town dress somewhat more carefully than their fellow-countrymen in the villages that is to say the merchants and shopkeepers do so they all wear the big hat made of palm leaves and the wealthier classes embellish its appearance by applying a light brown varnish to its exterior and surmounting its crest with a cap of silver scroll-work and a small spike of the same metal the Asiatic population of Hanoi is very dense, and in 1902 consisted of a hundred thousand Annamese and thirty-five hundred Celestials. 
according to the returns there were six thousand one hundred and ten native houses in the city covering a total area of about a hundred and sixty-five acres the french may well be proud of the european quarter of the capital of tonquin for its fine well laid out boulevards and streets handsome public buildings big shops comfortable hotels and well-appointed cafes would do honour to the prefecture towns of southern france such as arles avignon or montpellier though the principal thoroughfares of the town do not present the busy appearance of our eastern commercial centres such as singapore or hong kong and one does not meet the hurrying throngs that give to these two cities the characteristics of anglo-saxon activity yet the prospect of the rue paul bert the principal street of hanoi at the hour of the apertif is extremely pleasing and reminds one of the parisian boulevards in front of the more important cafes the pavement is occupied by the numerous round marble-topped tables so dear to the boulevardier after five o'clock every evening these terraces are crowded with habitues who while sipping their iced absinthe vermouth or bitter sit enjoying the cool breeze exchanging the tittle-tattle of the town discussing the latest apartmental or social scandal or watching the passing carriages smart little victorias or dog-carts drawn by diminutive well-groomed ponies and provided with yellow-skinned coachmen and tigers glorious in their neat liveries and top boots at this hour the ladies of the colony whose means permit of this luxury drive through the town out to the fine botanical and zoological gardens and alight at the kiosk to enjoy a stroll in the fresh of the evening and to listen to the band or partake of a cup of tea or an iced sorbet the male sex is also en evidence at these gatherings and promenades consequently the toilettes are brilliant and of the latest fashion and with a slight flight of fancy one might imagine oneself back at the cascade or the pre catalan in the bois de bouillon in eighteen ninety three as it is to-day the palace of the governor-general the residence of the commander-in-chief and the offices of the headquarters staff are situated in a portion of the town known as the concession a strip of ground fronting the river about one mile long by seven hundred yards broad this small territory was conceded to the french in eighteen eighty two by the emperor of annam and together with the concession at haiphong which was occupied a few years previously it may be said to represent the first foothold of france in tonkin the public buildings in the concession are well built and are surrounded by fine gardens the town is provided with a splendid system of surface drainage it is lighted throughout with electricity and possesses an adequate water supply which however is the cause of some complaint owing to the fact that the water is pumped from wells situated in the native quarter of the town and close to the river from which it is more than probable there exists a considerable infiltration in the centre of the european quarter of hanoi there is a lake the borders of this are covered with trees and shrubs and laid out with paths framed in verdure so that the effect of the whole is charming there are two small islands on the lake and on each of these is a small pagoda on the largest island which can be reached by a fine native bridge about thirty yards long built of ironwood is a beautiful though small specimen of a native temple known as the pagoda of the isle of jade and for the last five hundred years it has been the rendezvous for the literate of the capital the zoological and botanical garden to which reference has already been made is situated in the extreme northwest corner of the city it is splendidly laid out and covers several acres of ground it is here that the society of hanoi comes to drive or promenade of an evening before dinner and its fine avenues flower-beds groves and lawns compare favourably with the cinnamon gardens in colombo or the waterfall at penang the roads throughout the town are wide and well built and in this respect 
as in the laying out of the streets and the style of architecture adopted for the governmental buildings or for private residences the french are by far our superiors this is due partly to the naturally artistic taste they possess and also to the wise regulation adopted by the public works department in the colony with regard to the construction of new buildings all plans having to be approved by the department before a permit to commence building is granted in july eighteen ninety two when i had arrived at bak Ninh, it seemed after my protracted stay in the wild regions of upper yen Thê, that at last i had returned to a large town and the sight of a few score of brick buildings was for the first few days quite a novelty but when six months later i found myself in the capital of tonkin it was like getting back to a big european city and though we sometimes regretted the charms of our former adventurous existence both lipte and myself soon began to find a new pleasure in the renewed acquaintance with the comforts and distractions of civilization we were not as free as we had been at bak Nien, as we were lodged in a room set apart for us in the barracks of the ninth regiment of infanterie de marine and were for a few days the pet grievance of the noncoms of that corps who put us on fatigue duty and made us take part in the inspections this however was soon stopped by the chief of staff and we were allowed to continue the even tenor of our way there is always a certain amount of jealousy felt for the scribes of the army and the french sergeants were probably indignant at the thought that we were drawing as much pay as they were that we were allowed out every night till ten p m and also because we took our meals at the canteen in a room specially reserved for us the latter arrangement was adopted to avoid indiscretions for a few of us were continually and unavoidably in possession of facts that it was of absolute importance the majority of the troops should not learn for the next twelve months we continued our somewhat uneventful life as staff secretaries within the ancient precincts of the anami citadel the only break in the monotony of our career being my promotion to the grade of corporal which occurred in november i had waited a long time for my stripes and should have had them sooner had i remained with my corps but till then there had been no vacancy on the staff for a non-com so i had nothing to complain of in february our offices were again moved this time to the concession in a building close to the headquarters staff and we were lodged with the secretaries of that organization since i had come to hanoi my health had considerably improved and very soon after my arrival i was no longer troubled with the attacks of malaria which formerly at almost regular intervals used to lay me up for a day and sometimes more the change of air was i suppose chiefly responsible for the amelioration and the better food and more comfortable quarters probably helped to mend matters life in the capital was very agreeable though during the summer months the heat was terrible this is due to the fact that because of the low situation of the city the southwest monsoon is little felt there the french colonials i happened to come in contact with were extremely kind and hospitable and during my military career i made several acquaintances which ripened into friendships that never failed me during the subsequent years passed in the colony as a civilian the french settler be he either planter merchant manufacturer or shopkeeper is one of the hardest workers i have ever seen he possesses an admirable faith in the rich country he has adopted and a supreme contempt for his government which seems to delight in throwing every possible obstacle in the way of private enterprise and in ever increasing the number of functionaries he has to pay for in april eighteen ninety four general pernot practically reached the age limit of his rank and returned to france his place being taken by general coronat at the time he took over the command he was the youngest brigadier general in the french army having thanks to the services he had rendered to the republic and to his wide knowledge of his profession attained that rank when most officers in france's forces esteem themselves happy if they are in command of a regiment 
this distinguished soldier was by birth a basque the son of a modest cooper who plied his trade in a small and picturesque village situated at the foot of the rugged and majestic pyrenees but he was in demeanour speech and conduct one of the truest gentlemen it has been my lot to encounter tall and somewhat sparse fair with blue piercing eyes a straight thin nose a small light-coloured moustache and a very strong chin when listening he was reserved attentive and courteous when speaking his voice was wonderfully soft for a military man and as clear as a bell on first acquaintance he appeared to affect a certain aloofness but this was only apparent and was due most probably to the erectness of his bearing and to his habit of speaking but little and of fixing his eyes on the person who was addressing him so that unless they were acquainted with this particularity he would stare them out of countenance having gained a hard-earned scholarship the general obtained his grade of sub-lieutenant by passing through the military school of st cyr instead of being obliged like many of small means to work his way up from the ranks the work of pacification went on steadily but it was destined that i should remain at my post on the brigade and take no active part in the different expeditions sent against the pirates and rebels in eighteen ninety four ninety five in october eighteen ninety four i lost my friend lipte he died in the military hospital at hanoi worn out with fever and debility acquired during our campaigns in yen te i was by him almost to the end and he passed away calm and courageous like the noble true-hearted gentleman he had always proved himself to be he had been promoted to the rank of sergeant and had been made a knight of the dragon of annam shortly before his death on the twenty seventh february eighteen ninety five i was liberated having completed a period of five years under the french flag the experience i had gained was invaluable and i felt no regret for the step i had taken in enlisting nevertheless it was with an emotion akin to delight that i hailed my return to the liberties of civilian life it should however be mentioned that i experienced a certain regret at severing my connection with the french army and the legion while serving in that corps i had learned that there were good and brave men outside my own country and that courage obedience self-abnegation and national pride are not the monopoly of any one race by living side by side with them fighting and oft-times suffering in the same cause i had been taught to like and respect the foreigners the french italian german austrian or any other european soldier is very much like our own he has his virtues and his vices and the stronger his race and national character the more likely is he to possess a superabundance of the latter british interests in siam and southern china render the development of the french colonies in the far east a matter of importance to us the majority of the foreign products imported into yunnan via the west river route or through tonkin are of british origin our treaty arrangements with france and the good feeling at present existing between the two nations should make it no difficult matter for frenchmen and englishmen to agree in the settlement of questions arising out of their trade relations with guangxi guangtung and yunnan the recent concessions made by siam to france have increased the responsibilities of the latter and it remains for france and great britain to develop the commercial resources of siam and south china by the aid of the railway system agriculture and manufacturing industries are being fostered in the french colonies of the east and a great future undoubtedly exists for them but before real success can be obtained indo-china must be provided with functionaries who are not only able administrators but who have a knowledge of the language and customs of the country they must be workers with a single aim for the success of the colonies under their administration and not merely politicians whose personal ambitions colour their perceptions then the colonies wherein i spent the years of which i have written will have a future of constantly increasing prosperity before them 
End of chapter 8. End of A Soldier of the Legion by George Mannington.